Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right. We have invited Kelsey, Mia, and Matt to share their experience, strength, and hope on the topic of... I gotta grab it. Relation, gay relationships and sobriety, but hold on. I'm making that up. Okay. Uh, not so straight pepper diet, GLBTQ, which should be LGBTQ, but whatever, relationships and sobriety. Okay. Alright. So, our panelists will, we're gonna start with Kelsey, and then we're gonna have Mia share, and Matt, and they're each gonna share for about 15 minutes. And I would like to thank all of our panelists for their service to Ikipaw. Okay, so I'd like to introduce Kelsey Q. Hello, AA family. My name is Kelsey Q, and I am an alcoholic. Um, are there any gay drunks here? Just curious. Very cool. Are there any straight drunks here? Thank you guys. Thank you guys for being here. That's awesome. Um, we need more of that. I love that. Um, it is by the grace of God, sponsorship and taking action in this program that I've been sober since July the 22nd of 2011. Um, and if you would have met me July the 21st of 2011, um, you would know that it is nothing short of a miracle that I have somehow maintained to, um, maintained almost two years of sobriety and, um, that I'm here at an international conference, that I'm speaking on a panel at an international conference. That's, um, that's God. Um, and that's the power of this program. So I guess, like, we don't really know what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> it's kind of what we decided. Um, so I'm just kind of going to speak about, like, my experience um, being uh, gay, yes, but also being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and maybe throw some relationships in there. Um, we, yeah, we'll see how much experience, strength, and hope you can milk out of that. Um <laughs> Um, so, um, I, I don't know where, it, well, we're from everywhere. I'm from Oklahoma, and um, they call us the buckle of the Bible belt. And, um, and so I'm not going to spend just too much time on this, because I'm not a Bible thumper, and I don't believe in Bible hating either. Um, but I will say that um, when I got sober, they told me God was the solution. And um, my whole life, you know, I'd been told that God hated me. And um, never claiming to be a lesbian, but but knowing inside and knowing that in my bones. And so when I got to AA, I was um, conflicted because I, I knew that I was going to have to cry out to God and to surrender to God. And at the time, I believed that that God was a God that hated me. And that is how desperate I was for sobriety. Um, I was willing to cry out to a God that I just knew hated me, you know, um, if it meant that I could somehow get sober and stop drinking and, and um and that says a lot about the dark time that, that led up to me coming to AA. Um, very nervous. <laughs> I just want to say that it's really cool that I can speak so openly about something. Um, being from Oklahoma, you know, um, I, I uh, was really involved in the church growing up. And um, we kind of all are. Um, but, um, I mean, I was more so than the normal. Thank you. I really sound that. Um, More so than I think most people were at the time. Both of my parents worked for the church. And um, both my parents actually had a lot of experience in this program. And so I was raised with the spiritual principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, which was really, really great. Um, 
And I'm very grateful for that. And so when I came to AA, I felt right at home. But um, but I was also raised by parents that worked for the church and that actually stopped going to AA and started going to the church. And um, and they both ended up relapsing. And um, I have the most time out of my family right now at two years of sobriety. Um, but I, I will say that um, <laughs> there are a lot of great things that I learned in the church and that I absolutely loved. Um, I was a worship leader um, at a uh, mega church. I did the whole playing revivals and, and youth conferences. I traveled the Midwest playing this. I mean, I was really living and breathing this um, culture. And um, what that does to somebody when you're really claiming um, one set of beliefs and um, in your heart really feeling and experiencing another is just a total emotional um, turmoil all the time. And um, so I was really experiencing that. And so I was really prepped and primed to be an alcoholic. Um, I was so ready to drink. I mean, I, I had never had a drink, but, but that first drink that I had was actually with these people. I was working with the church, um, and um, I was 18 years old. And I had gone 18 years. I smoked a shit ton of weed before then, but um, <laughs> but I never touched alcohol. I was so scared of it, you know. And um, when I was 18, I had my first drink, and I remember having the conscious thought of, I'm going to be doing this a lot. Um, I loved it. And um, I don't think that I'm unique in that feeling of relief and belonging and um, that I experienced the first time I drank. And the first time I drank, I blacked out. And um, I can probably count on one hand the amount of times that I have had a drink of alcohol and was not either blacked out or passed out by the end of the day. Um, I loved it. And uh, it made me feel totally a part of, and it kind of silenced that turmoil that I had had um, for so long. And I actually didn't come out. I was outed, <laughs> which was um, traumatic. Um I did and said things in a blackout around some people, and um, it ended up getting back to this um, church that I worked for. And um, they straight up asked me some questions. I answered truthfully, and I was asked to step down. And, um, and everybody knew why, and that was really painful. And I think that shame is probably one of the most dangerous feelings for an alcoholic. Um, when we start to feel shame, it makes everything else bigger. And um, so shame combined with, you know, nervousness or insecurity just turned into this total self-loathing. And um, at that point, you know, I'd spent years building this uh, life for myself, and I literally had nothing. I had nothing. Um, I didn't tell my parents why I um, was no longer working for the church, and um, they were actually going to another church, so it didn't matter. They didn't find out. Um but I had nothing. I had no friends. Nobody wanted to talk to me. Um, and uh, so I threw myself into the gay community. And unfortunately, in Oklahoma, what we have is the gay bar. I mean, that's it. There's more than one. Um, but they're all on a block, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and so I spent quite a bit of time down there. And, um, and that's all I had, you know. And so immediately there was, like, this emotional security that I felt at um, – in this gay community, you know, and um, and also there was a lot of drinking, a lot of drugs, and um, and it was just the perfect storm, man, you know. Um, all that goes to say um, that that took me to a bottom pretty quick. I have no doubt that my um, coming out and my outing process, whatever you want to call that, um, was the primary fuel to my alcoholism. Um, I have no doubt about that. And I think it probably would have happened one way or another, but being so young and um, and being so ashamed um, and having no place else to go, um, I mean, it just made sense. And um, and it ended up with me being living in a house with a whole bunch of people that I didn't know, and I was drinking every day. I was um, doing other things every day. And, um, and I was, I thought my life was manageable, you know, <laughs> Oh, it wasn't. Um, but just to give you an idea to the relationship part, just to give you an idea of like how I would break up with people. <clears throat> I'm what they call a double winner. So, um, <laughs> so.
So uh, I qualify for both sides of the room. Um, I qualify for AA, and I am also an adult child of an alcoholic. I'm very codependent. I am a people pleaser. There's some of us out here. We're When they say sicker than others, that's us. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am a people pleaser. So I will either leave in the middle of the night. Um, he does that too. <laughs> or like I like try and break up with you and you just like won't let me leave. And I'm so codependent. I'm like, I can't leave you. You're right. I'm such a bad person. And, um, and so <clears throat> one of my breakups looked like this. Just to give you like an idea. Um, I went through um, this person's phone and started texting their ex-girlfriend as this person that I was in a relationship with. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I miss you as this person texting their ex-girlfriend. And, um, yeah, let's, you know, hang out. Call me later tonight. So later that night, I'm, like, with this person I'm in a relationship with. And their ex-girlfriend calls them, and I'm like, what the fuck is that about? (laughs) And they're like, I have no idea. I legitimately have no idea. And I'm like, well, let me see your phone. (laughs) And I, like, you know, proceed to go through their phone and be like, you were texting her all day? And um, it was me texting her all day. And... Um, and so I would leave and I'd be like, you're a lying, cheating, sack of blah, 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 you know? And But it wouldn't be my fault, you know? It was all my fault, but um, but I could, like, leave that relationship and somehow, like, the sick, twisted, clear conscience being like, they cheated on me, <laughs> and so now I can leave. Um, so that was my, like, relationship point of reference. Um, just a total inability to be honest. Um, a total inability to say what I wanted, a total inability to set up boundaries for myself. And um, honestly, I mean, yes, I am gay, but relationships are relationships. You know, there are things that work in relationships, period. There are things that work in relationships with your pets, with your boss, like with your partner, with your boyfriend, with your girlfriend, whatever. Um, there are just healthy relationship principles to practice. Um, and I had the privilege of learning those in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, that is... Um, the primary place that I have learned how to be a, like, normal human being and not hack people's phones and emails and, like, leave panties that aren't in my size in the laundry so that I can be like, I'm leaving and this is why. Um, It was so bad. And now you all know. Oh... Um, so that was my point of reference. When I started working with my most recent sponsor, the first thing that we did was a sexual inventory. And how am I doing on time, by the way? Okay. Um, the first thing that we did was a sexual inventory. And I told her that that was a really strange and um, that I didn't know why that was my first homework assignment. And she said that um, the way that we think God feels about us and how we feel about God is most obviously seen in the way that we treat other people. And um, and so we started there. And um, I don't know. People say all kinds of stuff like, don't get into a relationship your first year of sobriety. And um, honestly, I call bullshit because um, <laughs> because I think that is totally putting a numerical solution on a spiritual problem. If I know so many people that would not be ready for a relationship at a year of sobriety, you know, and I know people that are ready for a relationship the day that they walk in. So I really think that like spiritual fitness and, and all of that is something that God controls, not any kind of earthly worldly number. Um, unfortunately I have like was one of those people that was (laughs) 
ready for relationship on the first day in. Um, <laughs> and so this sexual inventory was like rather lengthy and they're like, there were like a lot of questions, you know, there are like eight things like, where have I been selfish? And I'm like, you literally want me to say all the places that I've been selfish? And she was like, yeah. And, um, so that was kind of a challenge. And, um, but I went to her with the sexual inventory and my mind was just like blown. Um, I had picked up all these lies, you know, about myself and about what God thinks of me and about what I think of God. And, um, And really, it all came back to, like, that initial wound from, like, being a gay woman and and having this God that I really thought didn't love me, you know? And I saw this pattern begin to emerge of, like, this sabotage, obviously. I mean, I told you guys the kind of shit that I like to pull. Like, sabotage, you know? And, um, And it was just, like, this pattern that kept emerging, even in recovery. Um, I'm not that crazy in sobriety, but I'm still pretty crazy in sobriety. Um, but, like, I saw these little patterns come up. And, like, the, the lie that I picked up that I think if I can say one thing to, like, the gay community in recovery, um, like, my piece of hope um, that has absolutely changed my life is that I believe and I claim that God wants me to be happy. And, um, and that was like painful to say, you know, that was painful to say, God wants me to be happy. I'm allowed to be happy. I'm allowed to be happy. God wants me to be happy. And, um, and it took a lot. I mean, it just seems so simple. Um, but I I don't know, like, um, that lie just was ruling my life. God didn't want me to be happy. I'd been told that my whole life, you know. Um, And I could pretend to be happy, and I could um, make other people happy, you know. And um, But that's not the same thing. That's not the same thing. Um, God wants me to be happy, joyous, and free, just the way that I am. And um, and that has taken me through a lot of depression, a lot of self-loathing, a lot of self-hate, so much self-hate. And... um, and, you know, today, um, I, I like, get to take my girlfriend to my grandparents' house, you know? <laughs> Oklahoma grandparents, <laughs> you know? And, um, and they, and they, um, love her, and she's my roommate. Um, <laughs> but we're getting there, you know? We're getting there. And, um, but I'm able to, like, not die on that hill, you know? I mean, I'm able to let them have their beliefs and their their truth, you know, and allow that to kind of walk beside mine. And we don't have to, like, yell at each other, each other's truths, you know? Um, we can kind of coexist in, in what we both are, you know? And that's been huge for me. Um, okay. Um so that's really great, and um, <laughs> um, I just want to say that I think, like, being from Oklahoma, like, I don't see this many gay people unless I'm, like, at, like you know, raving, you know, at the gay bars, um, but, which I still do sober. It's really fun um, sometimes, um, but... Um, I think it is so freaking awesome, you know. Um, my disease wants to tell me that I am unique, I am unique, I am unique. And I can't be sober because, and I can't get this because, and I will never be happy, joyous, and free because, you know. And um, and one of those things, one of those becauses is, you know, I'm gay. Nobody knows what it's like to be me, you know. And um, obviously, you guys have proven me wrong, you know. Um, so round of applause for you guys um, for keeping me sober today. I love you all, and I'm very touched by you being here. Um, I'm very touched by, like, on so many levels, um, just for my brothers and sisters in in recovery and also my brothers and sisters um, in the queer world, man, you know? So um, I think with that, I'm going to pass. Oh, man. Hi, I'm Mia. I'm an alcoholic.
There's a lot of love in this room. That's awesome. Thank you, guys. Like I said, I'm me. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, my sobriety date is January 8th, 2011. Um, so on the 8th, I just had two and a half years. And I'm from Chicago. <laughs> if you don't know that Chicago is hosting ECPA in March, you should pre-register this weekend. Okay. Um, and I hope Chicago gets the bid, too. That'd be awesome. Anyway. Um, I'm so glad, glad to be here. Thank you guys so much for asking me to speak. This is nuts. Last year at Akipa, I don't know if anybody was there or remembers. Yeah. I was like a trembling, crazy, scared, like one foot in, one foot out of the closet, little like, I don't know what was going on. I had long hair and I was like half dressing like a boy, half dressing like a girl, like wondering what I should pack. Um, I didn't, I didn't know how to shop. Like, I didn't know what was going on. You know, I was like, a tr my type, people would ask like, what's your type? Once I told them that I thought I was into girls. Um, and I would be like, I don't know. And like, pretty much my type was lesbian. Like if you, if it was clear that you liked girls too, you were my type. <laughs> and like, you know, it's crazy. I'm, I got sober at 22 and, um, my whole life I, or since, I don't know, sexual stuff started happening. Um, I knew I liked girls, but I also thought I liked guys. And I tried really, really hard for a long time to convince myself of that. It took a lot, you know. Um, my sexual inventory was also very long, unfortunately. Um, and so, like, a year and a half sober, I'm... I don't know. It, all summer in Chicago, pretty much, it's like one June is Pride Month, you know, and then in August there's Market Days, which is like a week of more gay stuff in Boys Town, and like so. Anytime there's anything gay, I was there, and the more like I put myself in those situations and like realized that I was hanging out with a lot of gay people, even though when I when I came out, I was like, I don't have any gay friends. Nobody understands, and like. I have, like, a close-knit group of girls right now, and we're all gay. And it just, like, happens to be that way. Like, our night plans are to, like, watch the L word. And, like, <laughs> queer as folk, you know? Like, um, I have a lot of catching up to do on gay culture. <laughs> but, so, you know, a year and a half sober, um, I'm going to all these gay events, and... For the, you know, when I would go to these events, I would, like, feel comfortable in my own skin, and I would feel like I could be myself, and then I would, like, the weekend would end, and I would, like, go back to my real life, and it was like vacation was over, and I didn't understand that, you know, I was like, why are these, like, events, these plans, like, the highlight of my life, you know, and um I started kind of, like, being, I don't know, talking to girls and stuff at Pride. And after market days, um, so the second gay event in, like, August last year, I went to my home group, and after my home group, I was like, all right, I'm going back to the, the gay bar to go dancing. Who's coming with me? And the only person I could drag with me was a straight guy friend that I had hooked up with in the past. So... <laughs> So we're dancing, you know, it's me and him. He's like newly sober because I, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, let's take a newcomer to the club. That's cool. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, I have to keep dibs on him. Like, what if he relapses and it's my fault? So I'm dancing with him and we're grinding and all of a sudden I feel like a bump and I'm like, oh, gross. And I was like, whoa, what just happened? Like, I just was grossed out by a penis. Um... <laughs> And then I'm, like, you know, laying in bed at night and, like, had this, like, screenplay going through my head of, like, all these all these things throughout my life that just did not make sense. And now they made sense. It was, like, the light bulb, you know, like, my life in, whatever, uh, five minutes in my head, um, which we all know our heads are fun places to be. Um, and it was, like, oh, you know, and then it was, like, getting sober again. I felt like I had to be careful who I talked to and like I was nervous about it. I, I was ashamed, you know, I was ashamed and I was scared and I was like terrified to come out to my parents because 
I thought it was wrong. My parents have never, ever had an inkling of anything that said, like, being gay is wrong. Like, we're from Denmark. It's really liberal. We can marry there, you know. Um, and so I was, like, so nervous to, one, talk about it at meetings. And when I first did that, it was, like, so amazing. And um, I went to this this meeting in Chicago that has a lot of gay people. It's not, like, a designated gay meeting, but it has a lot of gay people. And I had, like, talked to a guy friend about this whole, like, new discovery. And he was like, oh, well, you should talk to some women at this meeting. Like, you you need to talk about this with some women who, you know, basically, like, sponsorship type of, like, have more experience, have been sober for longer, have been gay and open and out for longer. And I was terrified. And I, like, pointed out this woman to him. Um, I was like, she's so cool. Last week she was wearing a flannel and Jordans. <laughs> now she's dressed up professional, like. <laughs> and but I was terrified to talk to her, you know, because one of those things that I noticed was like, why am I scared to talk to girls? Like my whole life I was terrified to talk to girls. I didn't have any girlfriends. I had all guy friends. Maybe it's because you like them, you know. So I'm like, oh, I can't talk to her. He, like, pokes her on the way out the meeting, and it's like, hey, this is Mia. She wants to meet you. And I'm like, hi. And she's like, hey, what's up? And I was like, hey. Um, she's like, how long have you been sober? I'm like, mm, a year and a half. She's like, that's cool. So what's going on? I was like, mm, I think I'm into girls, like only girls. And she's like, oh, that's big. Like, you should talk about that. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. She's like, how old are you? And I was like, I think 23 at the time. 23. She's like, oh, that's the same age I came out. And I was like, she's like, that's like late by today's standards. And I was like, oh, my God, you know. Of all people I could meet, this one woman that I think is really cool, she came out the exact same age as me, you know. And I, uh, the, one, the first time I'd been to that meeting, actually, she had celebrated 11 years. So, like, I knew she had some time. Um, but anyway, like I, I was just, I was terrified to talk to, to women, you know, and now it's like, I talk to a handful of guys, like pretty much all the guys I talk to are guys I meet up with at meetings or do service with all my other contacts are women now. And that's awesome. You know, that's awesome. Cause I was the newcomer that you could not get to call another woman. Um, I was also relation, well, no, I, I knew I wasn't relationship ready. So my first year of sobriety, I was just like having sex and saying, oh, it's okay. We're not in a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got in a relationship and cheated on him with his friend. And we're both in like the young people's community in Chicago. And then I had to like make amends and then everybody knew. And then it was really awkward. Don't do that. Um, you know, so when I heard we were talking on relationships, I was like, you, I, I told my sponsor, and she laughed her ass off. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I have no gay relationship experience to share. You know, I had, like, my first little fling, my first, like, month and a half long relationship, um, because I had no, like, I had no idea what I wanted in a relationship. You know, like, you asked me to do a relationship ideal, and I was like, um, hot, and... <laughs> Uh, good personality. <laughs> like, that was it, you know? And for a while, I didn't even know gender. I was like, eh. Um, <laughs> and, like, not that that matters, you know? Like, I don't think that, you know, people kept telling me when I, when I came out, like, don't label yourself. And then some people were like, what are you? And I was like, I don't know. Um, but, like, it was so important for me to know what the hell was going on, you know? Because it was, it felt so dramatically different for me. Um, because I, I grew up in an area that like, it just, I knew one out gay girl out of a thousand people in my high, in my graduating class, like 4,000 people in my high school. Um, and so it's not that it was like talked about badly or anything. It was just like not there. Like I didn't believe that gay people like had relationships and grew up together and like had families and stuff. I thought that like the TV shows were just making it up for shits and giggles. Um, and so like being more around Chicago, we have a gay Alano club, which is really cool, uh, with a meeting house building that has meetings all the time. Um, 
like just being more immersed in the culture um, since being sober and going like being in Chicago more and not in the suburbs. It was like, oh my god, like this is so cool. People do this thing, you know. I would go to Pride and I would go to Market Days and I would see like families and I would see, you know, longtime partners and I was like, that is, that's what I want, you know. I started noticing that I was not looking at the guys at all. I was just like looking at all these hot girls and I was like, damn, you know. <laughs> and like, it's, but it, I don't know. It, it was. You've all been there. You know, all everybody who's like come out and realized this about themselves. It was just like it was crazy. It was the fourth dimension type of thing. And I so I'm a year and a half sober and I'm freaking out about this and I didn't want to drink about it. You know, like I wanted to go out and meet people and like like it was talked about like a lot of that is going out to the clubs because that's a lot of the gay scene I guess um and but having like other gay people in recovery has been a lifesaver you know because I I'm fortunate enough that my first meeting had a lot of young people like young Ikipa is unbelievable I cannot believe that I'm standing here and speaking at Ikipa <laughs> like I came to my first Ikipa in San Francisco with like five months and I've been every year since, and um, I'm just so, so grateful that all of us have been fortunate enough to be introduced to young people. There's a lot of people out there who still don't know about it. You know, there's a lot of people who don't know that there is groups of young people. And, like, so I go, to, you know, I've, I've traveled to other countries and been to meetings, and I was at Yuri Pa. Um, I met a bunch of people here in Copenhagen, like at Yuri Pa, and um, which is a whole nother cool story. I'm Danish, and I went there for the first time sober, and it was like the day before my birthday, and it was nuts, you know. Um, and we have all these awesome opportunities to to meet people and like go to different countries and states and have friends automatically when we go to a meeting and say that we're alcoholics, you know, and that's how I feel about the gay community, too. It's just, like, I feel more comfortable when I'm with my gay people. <laughs> like, I feel more comfortable when I know that I can be myself and act myself and talk the way I want to. And, like, you know, I just I just started um, a job this year. Um, I have just became a nurse, like, real nurse. And I'm uh, working at a hospital now. <laughs> um, and I'm, like, it's it's weird. Like, I don't know how to act in a professional setting. I'm, like... Am I out here? Like, do I, it, like, alcoholism and being gay, it's, like, two completely different. I'm like, is it okay that they know that I'm sober? Is it okay that I know that I'm gay? You know? Um, and I, I've been, like, openly whatever to a few people now. I was, <laughs> I recently cut my hair, right, for, like, the fifth time this summer. And I went through this, like, stage, like, first here, then here, then here, then here, and now this. Um, and so I cut my hair again since I started working and these two awesome women at my job were like, Oh, I love your hair. You kind of, uh, well, I don't know. I've gotten all sorts of stuff about who I look like, but this woman was talking about, um, somebody was watching the Ellen DeGeneres show and I was like, Oh, I love Ellen. She's like, I don't like Ellen. She's gay. And I was like, I'm gay. It just came out. And I was like, damn. She's like, Oh, you are? Well, shit, girl, do you? <laughs> I was like, yes! <laughs> so it was awesome, you know? Like, I tell myself that it's, that it's like, scary and bad, and that's just my alcoholism, you know? Just like anything else, like, my alcoholism tells me that I'm a bad person because I had to go through all this st stuff, and now I can't drink because of it, you know? I'm grateful that I'm an alcoholic today, and I never, th I hated people who said they were grateful alcoholics. But, like, we get to do, like, today at the pool was, like, a spring break. Like, I never had that. I was like, this is the coolest spring break trip I've ever been to, you know? And, like, we all get to be here, and we all get to remember it and, like, see each other again and, like, hopefully not do too many stupid things that we're going to regret. And, you know, this this whole sobriety thing is such a gift, and... I'm just so grateful to be a part of it. I'm grateful to be asked to speak and be of service. Um, 
if you haven't been to, been of service in a, like a committee of any sort, a young people's committee, do it. Cause it absolutely saved my ass. You know, like there have been several points in my sobriety because I don't like to just like, you know, meet a sponsor regularly and work on my steps regularly. I like to like take long pauses and work on nursing school and like become a nurse and, you know, take, I can only study for my boards. You know, that's the only thing I can do at one time, even though I'm doing a million other things all the time. Um, you know, step work is always the thing that's on the back burner. But sobriety and uh, or going to meetings and being of service has always been a constant for me. Being in these committees and, like, going to the, all these post-committee and bid-committee meetings that I don't want to be at but then have a lot of fun and then I get to come to Hickey Pond, I realize I know a lot of people, and I have a lot of fun, and I, I have this family because I'm of service. You know, the first Icky Pie I was at, I was a few months sober, and I didn't know anybody yet, um, and I felt lost in the crowd, you know? And I hate seeing, like, I hate seeing the people who walk around by themselves and, like, look like they're still uncomfortable, you know? Like, let's talk to them. Because I didn't get, like, talked to, you know, I didn't get walked up to and talked to as much as I wanted to that first year. And I, like, sat in on the bid presentations that first year, even though I felt like it was boring as hell, because those were the only people I knew and I wanted to hang out with them. Um, and somebody on the committee I thought was hot. <laughs> so, like, you know, service keeps you sober. Do it. Um, um, anyway, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, I'm so grateful to have AA and to have gay people in AA because you guys show me how to live. You guys show me how amazing it is to be able to be open about ourselves and be comfortable in our skin and act the way we want to act and dress the way we want to dress and, you know, just be us and be comfortable with it. And that's amazing. I could never do it without you guys. So I'm grateful to be here. I'm excited to hear Matt speak. I love him. He was on Iski, or Ikipa host last year, so that's good shit. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt, and I'm an alcoholic. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, I'm just going to start off with I don't really know why I was picked for this panel. And um, and I really struggled a lot with what I was going to talk about. So we'll see how it goes. It could be a train wreck. Um, so um, I was thinking about it before this panel. And uh, I'm not really going to talk about like romantic relationships too much. A, because I don't have that much experience like uh, some of our other panels. But B, because like honestly... Um, be, and I think this is probably the most important reason, just because um, I've learned a great deal about relationships from straight panels, and um, I hear really good things there, and I think relationships are exactly the same as they are uh, for straight and gay people. So once you're in a relationship, I don't really think it matters that much. Um, but then, like, dating? Like, that shit's weird. Um, oh, God, I'm not supposed to cuss. Um, I'll try. I'll try. I kind of talk like a sailor. Um, so I was sobriety on May 15, 2010. Um... And it's awesome. Um, so, uh, when I came out, I was 17, not sober. I hadn't even had a drink, I don't think. And I, it was terrible. Um, so I'll just get that out there. Um, just was. Um, I don't know. And it was, it was terrible. And so I'm in, I live in St. Louis, right? Um, so, and I live in the suburbs, like the conservative suburbs. Um, and it was, it was weird. And I went to a Christian school, and, you know, I can relate a lot with the other speakers, which they've been wonderful. Um, just to say that the other panelists have been great. But um, So it was bad, and I met some gay people through, like, this gay youth group, and it was very helpful for me, and I felt friendships for the first time that I really appreciated. And uh, I'm honestly, I'm quite terrible at keeping up with friendships. Um, it's something I work on a lot, uh, which is another reason I don't know why I'm on this panel, but it's, uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, so anyways... Um, just fast forward, everything I learned about, like, how to act, like, about being gay, I learned from other gay people and um, from maybe influences that really weren't great influences. Um, I don't know. Uh, 
So I'm going to try to just skip through this really fast. Um, so I was kind of slutty. Um, I'll just get that out there. Um, and I always thought I was a prude uh, because I compared myself to other people, and I always thought I was like this prude gay man who never really slept with anybody but gave a lot of blowjobs. Um, <laughs> And, you know, and I, you know, I guess, I guess, I guess that's what this is about, right? Sex, like not so straight pepper diet. Um, so, and I was kind of like that. And I really did think I was a prude. Like, I took me a good year with my sponsor and I'd be like, I'm a prude. I've always been a prude. Like, I don't really do this. Like, I've been a prude. Like, I, I'm not going to go into numbers, but, um, that's, that's a little too much. But, um, I really did. And I was, and he's like, no, Matt, you were not a prude. Um, and I was like, yes, I was. You don't understand. Like, because that doesn't count, and that doesn't count, and that doesn't count. Um, and that's just how I was. Um, and before I got sober, you know, I was so lonely that I, w- I would do things that I, you know, fist step stuff. Like, it was really terrible. Like, I was craving human comfort, like, hu- like human connections. Um, and so I did some things that I'm not really very proud of. Um, and that's okay. Um, and, then I got, and then I got sober, right? And I, I live in a, I live in Saint Char- this place called St. Charles. It's like, when I go to meet, I don't go to meetings anymore. I still live there, but I don't go to meetings. I drive across. The, there's like this river barrier that nobody crosses, but I drive across it every day for meetings. Um, and uh, I guess only St. Louis people get it. But um, so I, I, I went to meetings in the St. Charles area, and um, I really thought that I might get murdered or killed in my first meeting because in my head, like I'm like thinking, like I'm this little tiny gay dude, and I like if you look at me, like I'm about the same size, like. Everywhere I was when I got sober. And I think in my head, like, I'm this little tiny gay dude and these people are going to kill me. Like, I really did think that walking into this AA meeting. And uh, there were a whole bunch of bikes out front, which scared the shit out of me. Because um, I live in St. Charles and there's a lot of bikers and I just didn't, I didn't understand. Um, and that was not my experience at all. And it was because I was gay. I thought they were going to, like, hate gay people and kill me. Um, but, you know, what? honestly, I've experienced very, very, very few times uh, any sort of discrimination in AA um, for being gay. Um, contrary to what I thought I would experience, um, I really haven't encountered very much, and everybody's always been very welcoming. But I, I don't know. I like to think people don't like gay people where I live, where, where I live, but I don't know if that's true or not. But um, it is pretty conservative. Um, so, anyways, I am getting sober, and like, it's really funny because like I came out like way before I got sober, and I got sober, and I like went right back into the closet um, really fast. And um, it was really hard. And, like, it, it really was, like, really, like, relationships with other people. Like, like I finally feel for, like, the first time in my life, like, I'm really actually kind of ready to have, like, a serious relationship. And I think that, that, that took a long time to get there. Um, it really did. And it took a lot of growth. Um, and so when I got sober, I couldn't even have relationships with normal people. And I think that's common for most people. But it was especially difficult for me because of this gay thing. Uh, it was hard. It was really hard. And I like I did not talk. Like I'm a pretty chatty Kathy. All my friends will tell you, like, I'll just I'll just talk. Like I go on road trips and my friend's like, Man, that Matt, he just like talks. <laughs> um and I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't talk to anybody. Um I was very, very quiet. Um and people used to tell me that they like didn't know I was gay and I was like, What? Like somebody doesn't know I'm gay. Like, that's amazing. Uh this is awesome. Um But I like couldn't have relationships and um like, even with my first sponsor, like, I thought that he was not going to sponsor me when I told him I was gay. I thought he was going to be like, oh, don't sponsor gay dudes, sorry. <laughs> turns out, turns out I actually had a great deal amount of common with him, and, uh, when I did my fifth step, it was very interesting. So, uh, we'll just, we'll just say that, um, so, my relationships with other people, and, you know, I don't, living in this, like, community I have, and it's, like, just a suburb, it's, it really is, it's just a suburb, but, like, I, like, had friendships with straight people, and it was new for me. Like, it really was. Like, I had been friends with straight women, but I'd never been friends with straight dudes. And so I was, well, this is kind of just funny, I'll just say it real fast, but I was, like, seeing this therapist, and she was like, well, maybe you're straight. And I, I had a fire, but anyways, because I was, like, I was, like, getting sober, and, like, I was, like, I'm friends with straight people, and it's really weird. And she's like, well, maybe you're straight. Uh, anyways, that's really not relevant, but it's kind of funny. Um. So it was weird. It was just, it was really weird for me. And I'm like starting to get friends and, you know, I just didn't really feel apart. And like, um, well, actually, you know what? I should take back. I didn't really face much discrimination. Uh, so I had a hard time forming friendships. And I'm still friends with people out there. And I think they've come around a lot more and I've come around a lot more. And, you know, we kind of meet in the middle ground and we're still good friends. Um, but like there was this meeting I went to out there and they would make gay jokes all the time. Uh, gay and racial. Like it was just like part of their meeting. And, um, 
I just, I couldn't really connect to it, and I hated these people. I really did. And like, so I get this resentment. It started with one person in the room. Then it came to the whole meeting. And then it came to all the meetings in the county that I live in. Ooh. And then, um, and after that, like, it went to the whole county. Like, everybody that lived in the county. Um, just because of, like, they made gay jokes, and it made me mad. And so I, like, kept going to this meeting, and I'd call my sponsor, and he'd be like, um, why are you going to this meeting? And so I had to stop going to that meeting. And I, it was really probably too dramatic on my part, but I, like, stopped talking to people. I just cut them out. And I, they would call me, and I wouldn't. And they really cared about me because they kept calling me, and I just wouldn't answer their calls for, like, six months. Um, so that's kind of sick, actually. But, um. So I did that. And I don't really know how this does with relationships, but it's okay. Um, maybe it does. Um, so then I found young people, young people in AA, and that changed everything. Um, I found like a whole new level of tolerance and acceptance with the young people in AA. And whether or not it was really there, I don't know, but I perceived it to be there. And so that was cool for me. Um, and so I got on this bid committee for St. Louis, and we bid for a key paw, and um, we were awarded it on my first time. And it was really, it was crazy, because I didn't think we were going to get it, because I thought we were like, I don't really understand how this works, but I thought we were terrible. But um, I don't know why I shared that. Um, but uh, it was... It was so good for me. Um, and like when, I, when we were in San Francisco when we did, and I got up on the stage, and I, oh, let me go backtrack just a second. I'm going to just stop it right there. Um, so this is like my first gay panel I've ever really actually attended. Um, I guess I attended one once before at a conference. It was a small conference. And all they did, all these people did, they were like five people from the same home group, and they all talked about their home group. And um, I, got up, I got to the mic for question and answer, and I was like, I'm just filled with disdain for myself. Um, and that was where I was at. And, you know, I'm totally not there at all anymore. Um, not at all. I'm, I'm very comfortable with myself. Um, and it's, it's been really great. Um, so anyways, I'm in San Francisco. And I'm up on the stage. We're doing our bid presentation. And everybody's like, well, everybody needs to go on stage and give a personal statement. And I, like, came out again on the stage. And everybody applauded. And it was, um, it was a really big deal for me. I cried. And I'm not a crier, like, at all. I'm kind of cold. Um, <laughs> apparently that's not true, but that's what I like to call myself. But, um... It might be true. Um, so anyways, how much time? Okay, cool. We're good. How much? Five more minutes? Oh, shit. Um, so relationships. Um, so I got a year sober, and I like I joined a dating website. Actually, in San Francisco, I joined these dating websites. And I'm kind of a serial dater. I'll just throw that out there. Uh, I'm really good at going on some dates, and I make really good dates. But I kind of do it on the Internet, so I don't really know if that counts. But it's kind of hard to meet gay people because I don't really like gay bars because they make me uncomfortable. I know when I was drinking, I used to have to you know, drink a quart on the way to the bar. Uh, just so I'd be okay, uh, which stopped working out because it's a 40-minute drive home from the gay bar. So uh, that's aside from the point. Um, so I do the I do the dating thing on the internet. I you know I wasn't really gonna talk about it because I really like don't like that fact that I talk like do it. But you know what? It works well for me. And you know, um, I'm a serial dater. It's bad. Like like once like for me like once I get past five dates, it's like ooh. Um, you're kind of boring, like, or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, it's, it's bad. Um, and it's, it's really is bad. And I, and we did a lot of work on sex ideals. Uh, that's definitely something I want to talk about. Um, so, like, one of the first dates I went on, like, like, I was meeting this guy in the middle of our state. Like, he lived in Kansas City, not in St. Louis, so we drove and met in Columbia, the middle town. And, um, uh, I was not gonna, like, I can't believe I'm sharing this in front of all these people, but, um, I was not gonna, like, fool around with them or anything. I wasn't. I wasn't, but I packed a bag, you know. Uh, <laughs> I did. And, that, and that's sick. And that's sick. And that was one of the first times, and, you know, I, like, fully in my head, I was like, we're gonna get married and have children. Um, but I'm packing a bag for the first time meeting them, so, you know, that's whatever. Um, and so I stayed. We got a hotel room, and I stayed. And, and you know, um, it was a very good growing opportunity for me um, because I felt pretty terrible after that. Um, and, like, it was so uncomfortable. Like, I did not respond to any of his calls, any of his text messages. And, and like, we'd been talking online forever, like, which I've learned a lot. If you want some good tips on how to, like, navigate dating online, like, come talk to me afterwards because I'm a pro. Um, I got a lot of really good tips, like how to how to get it, like just anyways. Um, it is what it is. Um, but like a third of people get married, a third of marriages, new marriages are from online, so don't judge. Um, so anyways, 
I felt really bad, and I really had to take a look at some of my sex ideals. And at the time, I had this sponsor who was somewhat conservative with his sex ideals, and it was really awesome. Like, I'm really grateful for this sponsor, and I had him for like a year and a half. And um, he had to tell me that he loved me all the time. Um, and that really helped me with my relationships with other people because I'd never had another guy really tell me that he loved me, especially a straight dude. Uh, I've had I've had mostly straight sponsors since I got sober. I have a gay sponsor right now, and let me tell you, it's not any different. In fact, maybe it's a little worse. Um, I don't know what's up with that. Maybe that's just me, but um, it's really not any different. Um, so anyways, I look at my sex ideals, and really for me, like, getting in the bedroom with somebody right away is not helpful for me. Um, it's just not. Uh, like, it's uh, like my calling card, like my calling card when I was drinking and when I was first getting sober is like, talk online a little bit. Yeah, we're talking online, doing good. And then we get, you know, like after a week, we go on a date. And then uh, after that date, we go back to somebody's house. And that's just what I did. Um, and, you know, I felt okay with that because I was, like, tricking myself that three minutes, four, two minutes. Ooh, girl. Um, so that was, like, my calling card. Like, that's just what I did. And so I had to stop doing that. Um, and I did. And I stopped doing that. And now I don't you know, I don't get laid a lot. That's okay. Um, I go on a lot of dates, but I don't get laid a lot. And that's cool. And you know what? I have a good time with people now. Because uh, it's not about the sex anymore for me. Uh, I mean, it is, but it isn't. Um, <laughs> And that's really, it really is really, really helpful. Um, so that was really, really important for me, uh, to change my sex ideals. And so I shape my sex ideals, you know, like, now I've got a rule that I follow, and it's good. And, like, it's just been, it's been really, really awesome, um, like, dating around. Like, I really, like, I know I haven't been in a relationship, and I've had a few times when it could have gone there. And it just, it's, it's really weird, because, like, now when I'm dating, like, I realize, like, like, after five dates, like, five dates is usually the, the the point where I'm like, yep, mm-mm, kicking you the curb. Like, usually I kind of know, like, after two, but then five, it's like, I'm done. Uh, and that's really cool, because then I'm just like, hey, you know what, I'm not that interested in you, um, but it's been really great to know you. And it, we just part our ways. And there's, like, no drama, no hard, I mean, I don't really feel guilty, because I'm being honest with them, and I think that's important. Um, and so that's that's kind of what I do. <laughs> I go on five dates, and then I say I'm not that interested in you. Um, I don't know. It's probably just the luck of the draw. Um, I'm probably destined to be single forever, but that's okay. Um, I'm just being funny. Uh, but um, what else? There's something else I was gonna say. Oh, oh, like one, the one thing that's been really helpful for me um, is I went to this relationship panel, and he was the guy who said it was in here, but he's gone now. But um, uh, it was a straight panel, and um, actually, I guess it was a chick who said it, but it's kind of funny. Um, so, they said, she's like, she said, like, her sponsor told her to take an inventory of her perfect partner um, and then become that person. Uh, and that has been very helpful for me. Um, and to be honest, I haven't really taken that inventory, but I've been able to put a lot of thought into it. So, uh, But still, I mean, I don't know if it really matters on that because it's, I don't know. I don't really know if it really matters if I write it down, but I've changed a lot. Um, just, like, practicing that principle, like, become the person that you want to date. Um, and I've grown a lot, and it's been really fantastic. Um, it's weird now, like, uh, I've got like a minute left. I'm good? Well, I'm going to say this really fast anyways. Um, <laughs> so, like, when I first started coming around, like, I was the token gay guy with everybody, and I loved it, because I got all the attention. I could pull the gay card, and everybody laughs. And I still kind of can, um, which probably isn't a good thing. Um, but it was cool, and now I've got like gay friends in the program, and it's really awesome. And uh, uh, it's weird for me because they're coming out in sobriety, and like I can like kind of help them. And I, I it's weird because people used to come up to me all the time and be like, you know, dude, I uh, I suck some dick when I, but you know, I'm totally straight, but you know, I pulled around with some guys. And people used to do this all the time, all the time. They just come up to me randomly, and I'm like, thanks for sharing. Um, <laughs> Like, like, this happened all the time. And now, like, people refer their sponsees to me, and I can, like, assist in that way, and it's really awesome, and I have a lot of great friendships now. Um, so, anyways, thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be up here, and uh, thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.